alcohol, the most widely used drug on the planet. Under its influence, we get drunk, we embarrass ourselves, we have sex, we get sick, and some of us die. But what really happens to the body when we drink? Why does alcohol make some feel good and others feel terrible? It may be the most popular pastime in the history of the world, but what do we really know about the making of a hangover? Chicago, the Windy City. Saturday night, a hotel bar, young people out for a good time. But this is no ordinary Saturday night. A handful of individuals are taking part in a unique scientific experiment. The goal? To explore just how alcohol affects the bodies and behaviors of ordinary people during a night out on the town. A specialist in alcohol-related diseases, Dr. Mike Baldinger evaluated each of our volunteers earlier in the day to make sure they were fit to participate. Eddie is a 32-year-old operations manager. What's the most you would drink on a, on a given day? Mm, about 18 beers. 18 beers? About a couple of shots and some mixed drinks. So you'd have 18 beers plus shots on a heavy drinking night? No. Dave, also 32, is a graphic designer from London. When you drink sometimes, do you uh, have a lapse of memory for what happens? All the time. You... All the time. Quite often do sort of go, did we go to that place? I can't remember going to that place. I wasn't there. Robert, our youngest volunteer, is a 21-year-old college student. We drink um, pretty heavily, maybe um, nine, ten drinks on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And sometimes, usually on Mondays, we drink quite a few beers, too. Sometimes Tuesdays or Wednesdays, but never both. Susan is a 30-year-old video editor. What happens when you drink? Um, firstly, I get very warm. My face gets flushed red. Um, and that, that's usually enough to kind of dissuade me from drinking too much, because it's uncomfortable. Kathleen is a 34-year-old insurance executive. After the accident, you know, I, it would be the greatest, most prophetic thing in the world to say, I never took a sip of alcohol again. You know, I'm an absolute teetotaler, and alcohol is evil. Um, but I do still drink. 25-year-old Cammie works in advertising. How much do you usually drink in an evening? Six to seven drinks. And what kind of drinks do you drink? Anything. <laughs> And Jessica is a 23-year-old mom and a billing clerk. So I think, it's, for me, it's like more of a social thing. It's not really, you know, if I come home and I'll have, you know, a drink. I wouldn't, I'd rather have water or iced tea or something. So it's just like, you know, when I hang out with my friends and stuff. It's 6.30 and the bar is open. Our volunteers begin to drink. Each has been asked to bring along a handful of their drinking buddies, who will keep them company during the experiment. Cameras are mounted throughout the bar to monitor their activity as the night goes on. In our specially outfitted back room, the volunteers will be watched and analyzed by a team of scientists. They will undergo a series of physical and mental tests to determine just how the alcohol is influencing their actions from hour to hour. All the volunteers are encouraged to drink intelligently and only to the extent that they are comfortable. But the scientists need to know exactly how much alcohol each volunteer consumes. Color-coded tokens are used to buy drinks at the bar, and a record is kept of each volunteer's orders. Medical personnel are standing by just in case someone goes over their limit and needs help. It's no secret why people drink. Alcohol makes us feel good. It can open up a magic world of elation, talkativeness, and laughter. But what exactly happens when we take our first drink? As Cammie sips her first cocktail of the evening, 
The alcohol passes through Cammy's mouth, down her esophagus, and into her stomach and intestines, where it's absorbed into the bloodstream and carried to the liver. The alcohol will eventually be broken down here, but for now, it travels to the brain. From there, it can begin to impact a whole host of physical and mental functions. Young and single, drinking is at the heart of Cammy's social life. Find out who is it. I call my dentist after I'm like, do you have a car load? We get together on Tuesday nights, and then Thursday nights are pretty big in Chicago, just going out to the bars, and there's different, you know, drink specials, different places. Well, even if I don't go out, you know, I'll have a glass of wine after work at home. Every Tuesday night is girls' night. The boys are banished, and Cammie and her friends share a few drinks. Can I get some glasses with me? And then they settle down to catch up on the news of the week, scandals in the office, and who's dating whom. Like, oh, is that what you're talking I about? Said, yeah. Remember, she freaked out. <laughs> <laughs> Alcohol relaxes us. It loosens our tongues, raises voices, and sometimes inflames passions. Much to like give me like a free bracelet. I thought like the coordinator. <laughs> We think of alcohol as a stimulant, but actually alcohol depresses the central nervous system like an anesthetic. In fact, alcohol was used as an anesthetic before ether came along. Uh, so the old westerns where, where you bite on the bullet and you drink the whiskey. It acts as all other anesthetics and sedatives. However, it starts by sedating those systems within our brains that rein in and hold our behavior to an accepted norm. So we remove inhibition, we become euphoric and disinhibited. With our inhibition suppressed, we become less discreet, more talkative, louder, and sometimes more confrontational. An argument breaks out between Dave, one of our volunteers from England vacationing in Chicago, and some local pool players. No, you're making that up. <laughs> I have never heard that in my life, no, ever. Because you you're trash. in the state. OK, all right. The sad truth is alcohol and aggressive behavior often go hand in hand. Okay. Statistics from the United Kingdom and the USA show that alcohol is involved in 50% of murders and over 40% of all assaults. Thankfully, Dave and his fellow pool players settle their dispute on friendly terms, and the game continues under British rules. 32-year-old Dave is a graphics designer from London who drinks between four to nine drinks five to six times a week. I don't think I have a friend that doesn't drink. We all sort of drink. My, my group of friends, I have a sort of hardcore of about sort of seven or eight friends that we sort of meet on a regular basis. In England, going out to a bar for a night's drinking is an old tradition. It can easily become a way of life. Dave will drink up to five glasses of Irish stout most nights and nine or ten drinks at least once a week. <laughs> no, 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 no. You are actually in the The thought of giving up booze alarms him. If I was asked for two weeks not to have a drink, then yeah, I'd miss it. Yeah, definitely. So what is it about alcohol that makes drinking such a pleasure for most of us? Alcohol disrupts the chemical transmitters in the brain and acts on the pleasure centers in the front of the brain, and the body is filled with a sensation of euphoria. We feel good, we drink more alcohol, it's an attractive temptation. Robert is trying a new drink, encouraged by Dave. That's serious. It's <laughs> rock. What is it? <laughs> Wow. Wow. Did you ever have one of those? We go out every Monday to a place, a local place. And then sometimes Tuesdays and Wednesday nights, like maybe we'll go out. We usually go out every Thursday. 
tonight, tonight we'll go out Thursday. And then like Friday and Saturday, usually Sunday we don't go out much. Some of us might study. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I do, we do a good amount of studying almost every day, but. Robert, age 21, drinks an average of six to eight drinks a night, five times a week. Robert is majoring in finance, but sports are his passion. He plays hard and drinks hard. For him, drinking is a bit like basketball, a test of speed and stamina. Yeah. Writing on material that I didn't read yet? It'll be all right, man. Yes, Galzo. Right. Elaborate drinking games are a key part of the fun. Right. It's not even going to be a series. Robert and his friends have any number of rules to help the beer go down. Jack, what's Jack? What's Jack? Uh, it's a rule, right? A rule. Yeah, a rule. Oh, a rule? Every time... <laughs> every time somebody gets a five, they have to do a bomb. Five of hearts. But in all the fun and excitement, the drinking can get out of hand. Binge drinking among young college students leads to 1,600 alcohol-related deaths every year in the USA. With his college friends, Robert is on a classic binge drinking session. Drinking fast can be dangerous, and Robert is the fastest drinker among our volunteers. In just over an hour, Robert has drunk two beers, one shot, and four vodkas. All night long, our cameras are monitoring the events in the bar. Our supervising doctor, Mike Baldinger, is watching Robert with increasing concern. Robert seems to be going at it pretty heavy. Um, he's a uh, binge type of drinker in that he drinks uh, a lot of alcohol quickly is drinking uh, shots rather aggressively, and you worry in those situations of the stuff just sneaking up on him. The doctor decides to call Robert in for some tests. Right. Pull up your sleeve. Do you feel, do you even have a buzz? Yeah, I feel a little bit of a buzz. Okay, Robert, here we have different pegs. The pegboard test measures hand-eye coordination by timing how long Robert takes to put the pegs in the hole. After an hour's drinking, Robert is now 10% slower than when he was tested at the beginning of the night. But he's not yet aware of any reduction in his abilities. And this is where the danger lies. It can lead to fatal misjudgments, and not only by college students. 34-year-old Kathleen is an insurance executive. On average, she'll have three to four drinks three times a week. <laughs> Kathleen likes to drink, but she's been a careful drinker since one dark night 12 years ago. I was 22 years old. I was in an alcohol-related car accident. And it was very serious. You know, and, and this is how bad it can be. This is how alcohol can just get you when you're not even thinking about it. Because, um, I, I, again, I was the passenger, and it was a path that we took all the time. And we got on the expressway going the wrong way and hit somebody head on. It was bad. The driver of the other car was killed. Kathleen herself was badly injured and spent six months in a wheelchair. Statistics show that in the United States, 30% of emergency admissions to hospital were alcohol-related, as were 25% of fatal falls, 30% of drownings. And alcohol was involved in a dramatic 50% of road traffic deaths. Ever since the accident, Kathleen has paced her drinking carefully. In an hour and a half, she has drunk only two vodka shots, much less than her fellow volunteer, Robert. It's just as well that Kathleen's being extra careful. Women can be at even greater risk from the harmful effects of alcohol. The long-held belief that females can't drink as much as males does, in fact, have some truth to it. If a man and woman of the same body weight drink the same amount of alcohol, 
the women will generally register a blood alcohol level one-third higher than the men. Of course, body weight can play a role in how fast our bodies absorb the alcohol into our bloodstream. There is another difference. Women are more at risk from the toxic effects of alcohol, as one of the world's leading liver experts, Dr. David Van Teel, explains. They don't metabolize alcohol within the stomach. And all of the alcohol is absorbed and goes directly to the liver and starts to produce toxic liver injury uh, uh, immediately. If a woman drinks the same amount of alcohol as a man, she will have a higher concentration of alcohol and will get drunk faster. If women drink heavily, they can be more susceptible to liver disease, heart attacks, and brain damage. It's 8.15. After drinking for an hour and a half, tongues have been loosened, inhibitions are disappearing, and secrets are shared that should perhaps be kept secret. Well, we were together for like five high school sweethearts. See, I was, that's, that's how I, I was. I was pregnant with her when I graduated high school. But so we're together. I'm 30. We, um, I didn't. Get, I got married when I was 23. She was 28. Um, the guy is 30. Jessica has a heart to heart with a woman she's just met at the bar. I was 31 years old. I was 27, almost 28. Um, Okay. 23 year old Jessica is a billing clerk and drinks only occasionally. I used to go out a lot more. Now it's probably like every two weeks, you know. When we get to the bar or club, we'll have drinks and stuff. Um, probably the whole night, I'll have uh, between five and seven drinks. Um, my drink is mainly vodka and cranberry. Jessica doesn't drink regularly, but when she goes out, she likes to party. Tonight in the bar, Jessica is drinking fast, perhaps too fast. Fortunately for her, the drinks are being monitored. And the doctor decides it's time to bring Jessica in for testing to see just how the alcohol is affecting her. It's clear that Jessica's motor skills and coordination are being shut down. And she's now much more likely to have an accident. When breathalyzed, Jessica's blood alcohol level means that she would certainly be a danger driving any vehicle. It's above the legal limit to drive in some countries in Europe. Three. Jessica's blood alcohol level has reached 0.53% the highest in the group so far. With blood levels up to about 50, the first things that we're going to see are some changes in thought processing, some beginnings of lack of judgment, and some difficulties with very fine motor tasks. We're here for about another week and a half. I want to party with you. <laughs> you Jessica okay? has drunk far more than she meant to, oh, I, and she's oh, continuing I, to drink. I'm <laughs> what started as a conversation with a friend at the bar has turned into a potential flirtation. She could be getting out of her depth, way out of her depth. Jessica seems to be enjoying herself, but she would later reveal that she has no memory of anything that happened after her sixth drink. By now, she's on her twelfth drink. Eleven vodka and cranberry juice and one tequila. Many of us have experienced the so-called blackout effect, where we've woken up the next morning with no idea how we got home or what we did the night before. There is now so much alcohol in Jessica's bloodstream that the normal mechanism that triggers our brain to store memories has been blocked. One of the problems with alcohol is you don't lay down the memories. So the evening is going on, you're taking in information, you're probably at the time responding quite well to it. But because you're not laying it down properly in your memory bank, you just can't recall it later on. Some drinkers face more immediate risks. Susan is a top video editor for a leading Chicago company. For as long as she can remember, she's had a violent reaction to alcohol that can cause her to pass out after only a few drinks. 
She's heard that many people of Asian descent have been known to experience similar problems. But what exactly is wrong with Susan? Susan is age 30 and drinks rarely. Now I understand it. Before the evening began, Dr. Baldinger well. tried to get to the bottom of her mystery reaction to alcohol. Um, firstly, I get very warm. My face gets flushed, red. Um, and that, that's usually enough to kind of dissuade me from drinking too much because it's uncomfortable. Let's do the patch test before we have you drink. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Baldinger suspects that Susan's painful reaction to alcohol may have a genetic origin. Earlier today, he used a revolutionary new test kit specially brought in from Japan. Ethanol is applied to the patch, which is then stuck on Susan's arm. Seven minutes later, the patch is removed. The red flush on Susan's skin reveals that she has a genetic trait present in about 10% of the East Asian population. Susan and her ancestors lack a crucial enzyme which allows the liver to break down alcohol. The effects can be very uncomfortable, but are generally not life-threatening. When Susan drinks, she's less able to break down the alcohol in her liver, so toxic compounds in the body increase. This results in flushed skin followed by nausea, an increased pulse rate, and a potentially dangerous drop in blood pressure. In essence, Susan feels many of the unpleasant effects of alcohol poisoning after only one glass. Pull your sleeve up. Are you intoxicated at all? Doctors are monitoring her progress very closely and bring her down to check her blood pressure. Though Susan's blood pressure is up and she feels flushed, there are no other side effects so far. Most of our drinkers are beginning to feel pretty buzzed by now. Some quite good looking girls for all of them have been tested by our scientists, and many have shown a significant drop-off in motor skills. We're also in first place after about nine or ten drinks. Robert, our young college student, is still drinking heavily. That's the way to fire him in there. Bloody perfect. Robert has just finished his tenth drink. Two beers, six vodkas, and two shots. He's now beginning to feel just a little woozy. From time to time, he feels as if the room is spinning. Most of us have experienced the spins before, but what causes this sensation? The alcohol has upset the delicate balancing mechanism of Robert's inner ear. The reflex which compensates for movement when he's sober now gives false readings, making him feel dizzy. For now, Robert can still play pool despite these head spins. But the pool table won't be the only place he and his drinking buddies may be trying to score. By his sixth drink, Dave decides it's time to strike up a conversation with Cammy. Right. Right. So this is your, how, how many? Seven. Seven. OK, you need to catch up. This may end up being just another friendly chat, but booze and sex have been eternally linked since the first grapes were stomped into juice. How many shots have you The loss of inhibitions brought on by alcohol can, in certain circumstances, prompt male and female alike to display uncharacteristic sexual daring. It can encourage some drinkers to do things they may not consider when sober, like hitting on a pretty girl they had their eye on, or going home with a guy they just met. <laughs> but what Dave and Robert may not know is as their minds are beginning to surge with sexual confidence, their bodies are going in the opposite direction. <laughs> the irony here is that the more Robert drinks, the more the alcohol begins to cut production of the male hormone testosterone and shrink his testes. You can show that within 24 hours of, of a drinking episode that testosterone levels drop. If he continues to drink and drink and drink and drink, what will happen is he'll lose sexual functioning. 
The alcohol also inhibits the nerve impulses that make the blood flow up the penis, and an erection becomes impossible. Heavy drinking can make a man infertile, and if Robert were to continue drinking at tonight's level for several years, the effects could be dramatic. As a result of lowering testosterone levels, and particularly chronically over time, men become demasculinized. Now, what happens when a man becomes demasculinized? What he does is he loses sexual hair. In addition, his muscle mass tends to wane. So they'll have, the shoulders will get smaller and uh, the pelvis will actually get bigger. You start to accumulate fat around the pelvic girdle. And continued alcohol use, you actually become feminized if you're a male. So for all you guys out there looking to get lucky and wasted at the same time, take note. Declining levels of testosterone from alcohol can put you out of commission for the night. And in the long term, your body could pay a much bigger price. Cammy is feeling a little loaded. By now she's down seven drinks, five beers, one cocktail, and one tequila. Cammy's blood alcohol level is nearly three times higher than in her last test. When was your last drink? I, I mean, I was in the middle of it. <laughs> oh, okay. <coughs> All the back. tests show that her motor skills have slowed dramatically. On the peg test, Cammy is three times slower than when alcohol free, and there are other less visible effects. Cammy is a dedicated runner, hitting the treadmill three times a week, but she has no idea that her level of alcohol intake can affect her. Heavy drinking in young people stops the skeleton reaching its full potential and ages the bones dramatically. If Cammie were to break a bone, heavy drinking would slow her recovery. If the athlete, either after a game or on weekends, uh, uh, engages in binge drinking again, which is so popular among college-age students, uh, this alcohol will, if they are fractured, will begin to slow the rate of, of fracture healing. The net uh, end result uh, is that the alcohol present in the body over a continuous period of time is going to damage the growing skeleton, the repairing skeleton, the healing skeleton, and it's going to aggravate that condition of bone loss which occurs naturally in life. Susan has had a few uncomfortable moments, but has discovered that if she sips her drinks very slowly, she can handle her body's reaction to alcohol. Tonight, Susan is okay, but she will always be at risk of a more serious adverse reaction. Back at the bar, Jessica is drinking a schnapps-based cocktail. She doesn't know it now, but this will be her last drink of the evening. Oh, actually, I can't, ma'am, I can't serve you anything. Why? Why? I have one. Oh, that's need to cut you off. Jessica has been drinking so heavily that for her own safety, the bartender has been told not to serve her any more drinks. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. Oh, no, no. Some water. You're going to wake up with a, with a throat like, a, like sandpaper. You got a lot of life in her. Life in her. Jessica is finding it difficult to follow what's going on. I don't understand. Jessica has now had 17 drinks. She has a dangerous blood alcohol level of over 200%. Between 200 to 300 milligrams percent in the naive drinker, you are running into a very definite danger zone. Here, respiration is being affected. Cardiovascular function, the functioning of the heart, is being affected. And death is possible at this level. Fortunately, Jessica is being monitored by our medical staff, and they call her into the lab for testing. 
Unfortunately, she is not feeling too well. Her eyes try to follow the moving marker on the screen, but her brain can't control these muscles. You're not okay. so good, huh? The test proves too much for sick? her. Okay, come on, let's go to the bathroom. Let's take these off. Why don't you come with me? Can you walk? Should we get you a wheelchair? Is there a wheelchair out there in the hall? That's all right, go ahead. Jessica's had uh, an unusual amount of alcohol given her past history of use. And uh, she was, uh, she's had an alcohol overdose. And as long as she's still arousable and uh, the next hour or two she's okay, we'll just pass it off to too much drink. If she gets any more uh, sedated, then the caution would lend us to send her over to a hospital to be observed. Back in the bar, our visitor from England, Dave, has gone behind the counter to mix up a serious drink called a flatliner. It gets its name from the flatlining of a heart monitor when you die. The drink is a mixture of tequila, sambuca, Tabasco, and Irish cream liquor. Yes. After several drinks, light drinkers feel sleepy, but heavy drinkers like Dave crave the stimulant of yet more alcohol. <laughs> so far, Dave has sunk 14 drinks, 11 Irish stouts, and three shots. Okay. In his final tests of the evening, all Dave's motor skills have slumped dramatically. The eye tracker measures fine motor control, but Dave's eyes can no longer follow the moving target. That was probably as we expected. This is erratic as hell. As we expected, you're uh... <laughs> it's like whoa. <laughs> hey, it's supposed to be going in a straight line, all right? Okay, he's like, not supposed to come. Uh, were you able to focus on it, all right? Yeah, no, but I'm conscious of the fact that sort of I'm looking at it and it's sort of going. It's going in a straight line, and I'm going. And you feel oh, like I'm it. looking at it like this. I'm going. Why is it going up and down? Uh -huh. Well, that's that was definitely apparent on your uh, yeah. on your movements. You know, this is this is like one of the hardest tests. Meanwhile, back in the bar, Robert has now downed 15 drinks. Three beers, nine vodka and lemonades, and three shots. This binge drinking means that Robert has consumed alcohol fast and in much larger quantities than his body can eliminate. It takes the liver one hour to break down one glass of alcohol. Robert's blood alcohol level is the second highest of the evening, behind Jessica. His blood alcohol level is 0.147%, nearly twice the legal driving limit. It's like 0.147. She saw Sheriff's shoes on the sofa, but she was so su sure she saw Sheriff's shoes on the sofa. <laughs> she saw Sheriff's shoes on the sofa, but she was so sure she saw Sheriff's shoes on the One sofa. More time, quickly. She saw Sheriff's shoes on the sofa, but she was so sure she saw Sheriff's shoes on the sofa. Terrific. Terrific. Good All job. Right. Eddie is next to be tested. I want to do tons. Eddie has drunk five beers, nine shots, and four vodkas. All right, ready to go. Sizzle, sizzle. Thistle, sizzle. All right. Sizzle, sizzle, thistle, sizzle. Oh, my goodness. So keep reading it. Sizzle, sizzle, thistle, sizzle. Finally, Eddie shows impressive coordination for a man who has swallowed 18 drinks. Frequent drinking has accustomed his body to functioning with a high level of alcohol. This is normal with heavy drinkers. All right. Very good. Good job. All right, my man. All right. That was awesome. That was absolutely awesome. Why haven't that stopped yet? There it is.
Here we go, it's slowing down, slowing down, slowing down. Eddie's blood alcohol will reach point 115%, one of the highest of the evening. Okay. That's it. Point 0.115. Is that, what's that, is that cool? That's uh, pretty high. What's pretty high? His well, was higher. It's above the it's above the legal yeah, limits I, I, of intent. Bob's was higher though. Bob had more drinks. No, Bob was drinking gasoline up there. Y'all didn't see that though. I got four tokens I gotta use. I hope the bar's still open. Our volunteers must stay at the hotel overnight, and we have arranged safe transport home for all the others in the bar. If they were allowed to drive, they would be putting lives at serious risk. Surprisingly, despite the evidence of the tests, Robert still thinks he can drive. I think a lot of people, when they're drunk, they drive very erratically, or they drive really fast, or they, they get stupid. But I think if you obey the speed limit and you do the right thing, even if you're a little over the limit, you'll be all right. Honestly, right now, I think I could drive safely. This is a dangerous illusion, as Robert is about to learn. A Chicago police officer has been brought in to perform the standard sobriety tests on all our volunteers. If any of them were pulled over while driving, they would need to pass these tests or risk a possible charge of driving under the influence. You can see the tip of my finger, right? I just want you to watch it with your eyes only, okay? Don't move your head. Officer Bear is looking for slow and erratic eye movement, which are both strong signs of failing motor coordination. Daddy, I need a bail check. What's that? Did he pass? No, he failed. He failed. All right. Another sign of heavy alcohol consumption that Officer Bear is looking for is the inability to follow instructions. Come on, let's get on with this test, though, bud. Walk and turn test. Put your right foot in front of your left foot. Touch heel to toe. Keep your hands to your side during the entire test. Okay? Continue to stay that way until I tell you to begin. You're going to take nine steps. Touching heel to toe on each step. You're going to count your steps out loud. Yeah, you're looking good, man. Two. Yeah! Curtis! When alcohol has reached a level that impairs memory, our volunteers find it difficult to follow the instruction they are given. Which way you want to And how many steps do I got to take? Okay, the instructions were to take nine steps there and nine steps back. Yeah. Apparently forgot there. I can so, remember. So, go ahead, take, go ahead and pivot and take the nine you, steps going back. But you gotta clarify that. Exactly, because I, I, I could take nine steps back like this. What do you want me to do? You write your alphabet down. No, you can't. Can you say them backwards? No, but y'all ask people that. Y'all ask people that. Five, one thousand six, one thousand seven, one thousand eight, one thousand nine, one thousand ten, one thousand. In fact. All our volunteers failed all or part of the roadside sobriety test. Over the next 12 hours, the drinkers will be monitored in their hotel rooms. A nurse closely watches Jessica throughout the night to make sure that the side effects of her alcohol overdose are continuing to subside. Jessica? How you doing? Okay. Every hour, she also checks the other volunteers. Hey. Some will have no recollection of getting into their room because of alcohol-induced memory loss. Hi. How did you guys get in here? How many? I think I was sleeping. How, how many drinks did you have? I had about 15. 15? Yeah, you guys snuck in on me. Yeah, let's, let's check your pulse for okay. you. See how you do. Now I'm alive. I'm doing good, Solomon. Alcohol poisoning is always a danger I'm for sorry. individuals who overdo it. Did I do okay? But accidental death from inhaling vomit can also be a more serious risk. Catch you guys tomorrow. No matter who you are or how much you've had to drink, the liver can only process around one drink an hour. 
This fixed rate means that the commonly held notions that cold showers or drinking coffee can sober you up are just not true. The liver has to do the work all by itself. But when the nurse gets to Dave's room, she's in for a surprise. Our British friend is not there. Dave is not here. Dave's desire for another drink has led him to break the rules and leave the hotel in search of another bar and another drink. The craving for alcohol in Dave's case may be either psychological or physical, or both. But new American research suggests that some drinkers get more of a buzz from alcohol than the rest of us. Scientists at Brookhaven National Laboratory believe that there may be some genetic mechanism wired into the brain which can create a physical craving for the pleasurable effects of alcohol. To test their theory, they experimented with rats. The rats were offered two bottles, one containing pure water and the other containing 10% alcohol. Over the course of a few days, some of the rats showed a marked preference for the alcohol. It raised the question, was this the effect of the alcohol or were these rats predisposed in some way to seek out alcohol? Dr. Thanos uses state-of-the-art scanning to look at the rats' brains while they're still alive. In both humans and rats, dopamine acts on the D2 receptors in the brain. Some alcoholics have been shown to have below average levels of these receptors. Could this lead them to crave alcohol? The scientists at Brookhaven wanted to find out if increasing the levels of D2 receptors in the rat's brains to normal levels would reduce the rat's alcohol consumption. The results were very dramatic. The animals that had a very high level of alcohol preference, 80, 90 percent, after treatment with the D2 gene, their alcohol preference went down to 30, 20 percent in a matter of days, really three to four days. There was quite a dramatic shift in uh, behavior, in alcohol intake. It's early days yet, but this genetic research may one day enable doctors to help heavy drinkers cut their consumption as dramatically as these rats. Okay, take a deep breath. Most experts would agree that alcohol abuse over time can result in serious physical and psychological distress. But long-term damage from alcoholism is far from the minds of our volunteer drinkers. Going to have to stop reading the paper. Right? They're still recovering from the night before. <laughs> How you guys doing? There are a few aching heads. According to the breathalyzer test this morning, blood alcohol levels for most have fallen to zero. Okay. But the effects of a heavy night of drinking are still taking their toll. So you have a big bottle of water. Do you, do you just naturally reach for that after a night yeah, of drinking? Yeah, definitely. Water's good. Nobody's quite sure what a hangover it is. It's, it's a combination of uh, events. One is... Uh, it may be a combination of the effects of the alcohol uh, combined with lack of sleep, lack of eating. Uh, certain types of alcohol are more prone to producing hangovers. Under what circumstances do you get a hangover? I rarely get them just because I think I control... So do specific drinks intensify our hangovers? I mean, Does mixing that, different types of booze set us up for a painful morning? Better. Wine usually is the killer for me. Like last night, I mixed a lot of drinks, and I think that's why I feel a little sick this morning. There's certain, is it the mixing of drinks, or are there certain types of alcohol that uh, you are more likely to get a hangover? I think it's the mixing. Some beer and then rum and vodka. I think that's what... Unfortunately, science sick. has little to offer on this count. Scotch or no. The anecdotal or information or suggests or simply that different people react differently depending on the happens, situation. Um, but what can science tell us about a cure for the hangover? The fact that there are a lot of cures seems to indicate that there's no single mechanism for hangover. Everybody has their own. Frequently, it's eating a meal uh, after drinking or prior to drinking or both. 
um, drinking a lot of fluids. Everybody has their own remedy for this. Yeah. How about you, Kim? Did you, uh, you have any side effects from your drinking last night? No, I think I'm just kind of tired, but nothing other than no that. No headache, no, no. upset stomach. Hangover remedies may be based more on individual results than on any specific medical finding. But there is one surefire cure that science can offer. Don't drink so much. Jessica arrives for breakfast, but has just thrown up again in the bathroom. She remembers little about last night after her sixth drink. In fact, Jessica drank 17 drinks last night. Several times? No. What was, what was it up to? Uh, you win. You had the highest level for the evening. Oh, my God. What was it up to? We were, I was a little concerned. <laughs> last night, Jessica reached a blood alcohol level of 0.240%. If she had continued to drink, it could have been fatal. At very high concentrations of alcohol, the brain centers that control breathing shut down. No more messages can be sent to tell the lungs to carry on breathing, so they stop working and the person dies. Eleven hours after her last drink, Jessica's blood alcohol is still .098, well above the legal driving limit. .098. Dr. Baldinger insists Jessica must stay at the hotel until her blood alcohol level drops significantly. In fact, it didn't reach zero again for another eight hours. Last to arrive is Dave. Dr. Baldinger asks him about his late night drinking. So you went out and uh, had something to drink after? Nope, thing. I went out for a walk and then I went to bed. Oh, you did? Because we heard rumors to the contrary. <laughs> Prove otherwise. <laughs> well, that's why we have this. <laughs> no, I made sure of that. So, um, yeah, no, I went quick drink. Dave says that when he went out, he had another couple of beers before becoming bored and returning to the hotel at around 4 in the morning. Dave had 14 drinks before midnight, and another two or more after that. I just think, fine, if you're gonna, if you're gonna Dave's blood alcohol level has now fallen to .043. He vows to stick to water, for a few hours at least. After a heavy night of drinking and in the presence of a hangover, people's judgment, ability to drive, ability to do complex functions, both intellectually and in terms of motor function is impaired even when the alcohol level is zero. That's been shown in uh, numerous experimental studies. The dangers that people feel since their blood alcohol level is, is zero, that they're okay, and that's not the case. Some of our volunteers drank what they normally drink on a Saturday night, others a bit more than they meant to. But most of them were surprised to learn how much even small amounts of alcohol affected their bodies and their minds. Motor skills and hand-eye coordination slumped dramatically after only two drinks and continued to get worse. More than half were above the legal limit to drive, but all would have been unsafe behind the wheel. Will the information our volunteers have learned compel some to think twice next time they belly up to the bar for one more drink? Perhaps. But chances are that on a future Saturday night, a few will find themselves busy yet again at one of the world's most notorious and celebrated diversions, and well on their way to the making of another hangover.
觉享受的极致。Discovery 频道，开拓您的世界。